testing one, two, test, test. Not yet. You hear me? Yes. Okay. I hear you too. That means everybody can hear us. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and let me get it up on a laptop here so I can see what everybody else is seeing. While we're just finishing getting up, I'd just like to welcome everybody that has joined already. Um, we will get started here in about a couple minutes, so thank you for your patience. All right, we'll give just a couple more minutes to get some uh, of the like, people to kind of get time to get settled in, and then we'll get started. So just a few more minutes. All right, we're going to get, go ahead and get started on time, actually. So I'd like to just like to thank everyone that um, has a, uh, is, has joined today uh, for our uh, technical training series. Um, and today's topic is going to be what's new with vSphere 5.5 and the vCloud suite. And our presenter today is going to be Jeff Weiss. And I'll just go ahead and hand it over to Jeff. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jeff. So yes, you have two Jeffs on the line. My name is Jeff Weiss. I uh, want to thank you also for coming today. Um, I do want to pre-apologize for my voice. It's a little ragged. I've been up all night on a, a consulting gig and technical support calls to Microsoft and VMware, which I know many of you can appreciate. Um, so I will do my best to stay lubricated and, and keep things flowing for you here. Uh, I am the global... EVP, CTO, and Director of Training for a couple of companies. Uh, Global Training Solutions slash VM Training is one. That's our training side of the world. And AES, or Advanced Enterprise Solutions, is our consulting side of the world. Um, been in the field a long time. I had a 
computer that came out before the IBM PC, so you have an idea of how long I've been doing this. Um, I've done literally everything in the field, um, from consulting to training, uh, to implementation, to soldering, to wiring, you name it. So help desk, ran help desk, uh, was in sales for a long time, marketing uh, at the retail, national distribution, and manufacturer levels. So I've done it all. Um, Currently, we're doing consulting for every size organization on the AES side, uh, from very small to medium to large enterprise customers. Uh, we've done migrations for companies like Yahoo and uh, the largest hedge fund in the country and some of the major banks and government and you name it. Um, training, I've been in training management for the last 15 years, but I'm also a trainer. I'm the last one on the list that gets to go out. When I run out of trainers, I get to go on the road too. So I still do some training as well. Um, I am not the person who was going to do this originally, so we had to throw a slide in here for me. Um, someone else is going to do it, but they were asked to speak at a conference in Iceland this week, so I'm taking over. You can see the certs. I'm VMware certified. I'm certified by VM training as well with the Certified Virtualization Expert. That's the CVE 3, 4, and 5 you see at the end there. Good old Microsoft from the old days and a lot of certs that probably have just died away. So that's me. Now, today's topics, we're going to cover vCloud Suite uh, 5.5 very briefly because the focus of this is really vSphere 5.5. Um, but it's important to kind of understand where the future is going. Uh, repetitive theme at VMworld 2013 this year in every single lecture was the software defined data center. Um, the architectural approach that VMware is taking to extend virtualization concepts that you know, such as abstraction, pooling, and automation to all data center resources and services. That's their focus. Ultimately, to virtualize everything in the data center, all compute, all storage, all networking, all security. And that's the that's in essence what vCloud Suite's all about. The intent is to speed up and simplify everything we do, initial provisioning, ongoing management, um, by fully virtualizing all those different components, and do it all with powerful policy-driven automation. Um, we also will talk about vSphere 5.5. There are five main areas that have uh, changes to the platform. The first one is going to be the hypervisor itself, we always start with the core hypervisor, ESXi 5.5 enhancements. Then we'll move on to uh, virtual machine or VM enhancements. We'll move on to what they've done for vCenter. And then we'll get into storage and networking. So first, the vCloud suite. Uh, provides all the components for building and running a private cloud infrastructure. It's based on vSphere. Uh, that's still the core technology at the heart of it. I've got a slide on the next slide shows a, a, a base picture. There's a lot of different variations on the theme as to how VMware portrays all of their different components, but I'll show you one on the next slide that kind of puts it together a little bit visually. Um, but again, the idea to leverage the software defined data center architectural approach that delivers virtualized services for you. Uh, Built-in intelligence, automation, on-demand provisioning, configuration control, etc. It's comprised of a series of technologies. You see vSphere obviously at the core there, your compute virtualization platform with policy automation capabilities. It also has vCloud networking and security uh, with an ecosystem integration for virtualized compute environments. They've bundled it together to handle both virtualization of networking and security in one package. Uh, vCloud Automation Center, VCAC, VCAC, uh, self-service and policy-enabled cloud service prov po uh, provisioning. It's a layer above vCloud Director. Some of you have make, may have worked with vCloud Director uh, in the future. Um, VCAC is supposed to absorb many of the higher end features of VCD. Um, some of the features are going to be put down into vSphere and some of the features, uh, the rest of the features are basically going to eventually be merged up into VCAC um, so that you'll have that separation. vCloud Director is supposed to go to what, go away after 5.5. Uh, vCloud Director right now 
uh, of course, is how you virtualize your data centers with multi-tenancy and public cloud extensibility and catalogs of, of uh, resources for things like uh, compute, et cetera, networking, um, vApps, and so on. Um, and then if you have the Enterprise Edition, since there are three editions, there's standard, advanced, and enterprise of the vCloud suite, uh, they include Site Recovery Manager, their automated DR product for planning, testing, and execution with that. Uh, the other three product, uh, the other remaining products are in both standard and advanced. Um, unfortunately, when you buy their vCloud suite, you can't just upgrade an individual product. You have to upgrade the entire suite of packages. Um, so once you say you buy in at standard and you want to go to advanced, you got to buy the advanced vCloud suite to get upgraded. You can't just do vSphere. There are add-ons for vCloud Suite 5.5. Um, the first one is created a lot of buzz. Uh, everybody was talking about it at VMworld. Uh, Virtual SAN or vSAN is currently in beta. Unfortunately, it's not immediately available. It is available to anyone who wants to go to their site and sign up and get the beta. If you've got 5.5 installed uh, of ESX and vCenter, then you can use uh, vSAN in beta format. You basically get a key when you sign up. The uh, capability is already integrated into the hypervisor. So all you have to do is get the key and then you can turn it on and use it. Um, vSAN basically allows software-defined storage platform. It's going to pool and automate local storage and turn it into shared storage. It's going to make it appear as a SAN to the rest of your environment, to all of your hosts, etc. Uh, I already mentioned it's integrated into the kernel. Um, you can pull locally attached SSDs. you got to have at least one per host in a vSAN cluster. Uh, it's used for actual storage, placement of your VMs, etc. So pretty exciting technology. Probably going to uh, go GA uh, first quarter, I think, end of first quarter, beginning of second quarter, they say, next year. Uh, another exciting technology that was announced is NSX. Now, it's talked about with vCloud Suite and marketed that way, but realistically, NSX is available even with just plain vSphere if, if you don't have all the other components of vCloud Suite. Um, the idea behind that is a comprehensive security and network virtualization product that completely decouples your hardware, uh, layer 2, 3 virtualization, basically, of all your networking allows for rapidly building virtual networking as needed. So um, you, it really doesn't matter what you have as far as uh, physical technology. As long as um, they support IP transport, that's the only requirement. As long as all of your components, your, your switches and routers support IP transport, then this isolates all of that hardware and basically presents a virtualization layer of networking above it, and you can carve it out however you need using distributed switches and port groups and, and routers, virtual routers, really, and everything else. It's, it's really kind of exciting. Um, it is not part of any of the main suites. It's a separate purchasable product. And the others, as you can see, if you're looking at the picture down here, you can kind of see where these components that are light blue fit into the uh, vCloud suite, whereas the grade ones are basically add-on products. Um, we've talked about these two, and now we're talking about the IT uh, business management one over here on the right. Um, we've got vCloud hybrid service, uh, VMware's own public cloud service based on, of course, software-defined data center architecture, uh, helping you or your customers to create hybrid clouds. Got vCenter's log insight, scale-out log aggregation, and analytics for virtual environments. And finally, you've got business management which includes IT financial management and cost benchmarking for apps and services within cloud environments. So that covers the vCloud suite. Let's move on to all the bits and pieces that make up vSphere 5.5 then and what's new. Okay. Um, realize that I'm touching on as many as I can of the new technologies, but realistically there's about 175 or more new technologies in 5.5. A lot of them are tiny, but they're there nonetheless. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the major ones, not all of them. Uh, we don't have time within our 40-minute, 30-minute window, whatever I've got left. Um, but our class does cover them. Well, what's new in Upgrade class, we'll talk about it at the end. And certainly we cover them in the 5.5 boot camp that we also have. So we'll get to that. 
Anyway, the first one is hypervisor enhancements. Um, they've added hot pluggable PCIe SSD devices. Uh, you can see in the slide it says Dell and Micron worked with VMware to create this feature. Um, like we were able to do with traditional storage devices of SATA and SAS having hot swap ability, solid state disks, of course, are becoming more prevalent throughout your data centers, and the same capability has been expanded to them. Um, users are now able to hot add or hot remove SSD devices while vSphere hosts are running, and the underlying storage stack detects the operation. The PCIe layer code of ESXi is enhanced to handle surprise removals and insertions of PCIe devices. Now, if you're to look at Dell's site, they say as of, I think, the 27th of September, no one else but Dell has, is supporting this directly yet in their hosts. But I'm sure that's either changed or bound to change by now. Um, the idea is no downtime support when you replace and remove your SSDs. The next technology that's a hypervisor enhancement is reliable memory technology. Um, since the hypervisor itself runs directly in memory, any error in it could cause potentially a crash of the host and the VMs that are running on that host. So that there's greater resiliency and protection against memory errors, the hypervisor can now take advantage of this RMT. It's a uh, CPU hardware feature, basically, where a region of memory is reported from the hardware to the host hypervisor as being reliable. Um, that info is then used to optimize the placement of the VM kernel and a bunch of the other critical components, uh, like the initial thread, the host D process, the watchdog process, and so on, helping to guard against memory errors. They've also enhanced the hypervisor with CPU C states. Um, in 5.1 and earlier, they, they had a balanced policy for host power management leveraged only through the performance state or the P state. Um, which kept your processor running at a lower frequency and voltage. Now, in 5.5, they've added the deep po processor power state called C-state, um, which provides additional power savings. Another benefit is the reduced power consumption is inherent, is inherent increased performance because turbo mode frequencies in Intel chips can uh, be reached more quickly while other CPU cores in the package are in their deep C-states. You see down here at the bottom of the screen a picture of, of course, the web client, where everything's going, um, of the power management settings for your C states. And you can edit that and adjust which of the uh, um, states you want it, uh, which of the power savings levels or management you want it to be in. Next, we have virtual machine enhancements. Uh, we've, we know that all along they've had hardware versions. And in the last version of ESXi, they came out with VM compatibility, although they still called it a hardware version underneath, hardware version 9 and 5.1. Well, of course, in 5.5, they've come out with hardware version 10. Um, that compatibility or hardware version has several features, such as LSI SAS support for Oracle's Solaris 11 OS. Uh, there's also enablement for new CPU architectures and... There's a new advanced host controller interface, or AHCI. That's a new virtual SATA controller that supports both virtual disks and CD-ROMs. What you can do is connect 30 devices to each controller, and it'll support up to four of these. So now you have as many as 120 disk devices instead of the previous limit that we had of uh, 60 on the standard SCSI one. We also have enhanced virtual GPU support. vSphere 5.1 did have or release support for hardware accelerated 3D graphics, uh, virtual shared graphics acceleration or VSGA inside a virtual machine, but it was limited to only NVIDIA based GPUs. So if you put a, a video card with a GPU inside your host, but it, and it was NVIDIA, then you could take advantage of it primarily for VMware View or now Horizon View. Um, but it was available nonetheless. With 5.5, what they've done with this S VSGA uh, support is expand it to both NVIDIA and AMD-based GPUs. Um, and there's three different modes involved as well. Um, 
and eventually it's going to support supposedly more GPU vendors, makes models, and so on. So you just got to keep up with the typical compatibility guide to see what that's all about. The three supported modes for virtual machines include automatic hardware and software. VMs can leverage that technology even through vMotion, depending on which of those options you've chosen, um, even a heterogeneous mix of GPUs and your hosts. No downtime, etc. obviously. Automatic mode is enabled if that's the one you've chosen and a GPU is not available at the destination host on a vMotion, software rendering is automatically going to kick in. If you have chosen hardware mode and the GPU doesn't exist on the destination host, then obviously vMotion can't move that. Uh, the instance isn't even attempted. The SG, <laughs> easier for me, VSGA support can be enabled on both uh, through the vSphere web client or Horizon View if your OS is inside your clients or Windows 7 or 8. Um, Linux OSs are also supported specifically Fedora 17 or later, Ubuntu 12 or later, and Red Hat 7, um, but that can only be done through the uh, web client. Next we get to the graphic acceleration for Linux guests. vSphere 5.5 has graphic acceleration possible for your Linux hosts or guests, excuse me. Leveraging a GPU and the host can improve your performance and scalability, provide support. Uh, VMware is the first to develop a new guest driver that accelerates the entire Linux graphics stack, and it's being implemented in modern Linux distributions. 100% um, of that code is being returned to the open source community, meaning any distro that chooses can in integrate it to their guest driver and provide out-of-box support for accelerated graphics without any additional tools. And again, Ubuntu 12, Fedora 17, and RHEL 7 or above. With the new guest driver and the enabled support technologies, you can support things like OpenGL 2.1, DRM kernel mode setting, and some other things as well. So if you have high-end graphics you're running in Linux environments, that's that's a pretty uh, significant addition to the VM enhancements. Uh -huh. Now we move on to vCenter enhancements. I don't know about you, but if you've implemented 5.1 and you did it early on, then you know one of your worst nightmares was SSO. SSO, I'm happy to report, has been re rebuilt from the ground up in 5.5. Uh, authentication services have been enhanced to provide a richer experience. Um, <laughs> they're trying to get rid of the challenges we all faced before. Um, they used feedback, obviously. They've simplified the deployment. Now there's a single installation model. Woohoo! It's about time. No matter what size you are, you don't have to pick that you're a sole setup in a single environment. Or are you going to be the first one in a multi-site uh, or an eight or a high availability SSO environment? One model for everybody, and you can expand it down the road. One of the problems we ran into, especially for customers that chose to do simple installs uh, in the beginning, they were set up with the uh, type of SSO that was not easily moved to the first node in a multi-site or a HA available SSO environment. So that no longer is a concern. The really good news is if you were going to do that and now you're looking to upgrade to 5.5, upgrading to SSO 5.5 removes that restriction that we had from the simple install before. So the SSO you end up with can be eventually part of a multi-site or an HA-based uh, SSO. So that's really slick. They've also removed the database requirement. There is no more database need like SQL, etc. cetera. Uh, not even sure what they're doing. I mean, the amount of data that SSO stored for itself, local accounts within SSO, et cetera, the types of connections, um, identity sources, and whatnot, really was minimal. So there really isn't a need for the high-end database that they were forcing us to use. That simplifies the setup and installation as well. Um, probably some kind of flat file thing they're using, but I haven't really dug into it that much. They've also added enhanced Active Directory integration. Instead of just using LDAP, you can actually connect directly to Active Directory. Um, enables cross-domain authentication, one- and two-way trusts, and multi-domain environments. So um, they've really simplified and made it much more uh, user-friendly, uh, at least from an installation and support standpoint. 
Uh, I've got one little tweak about it. I'll talk about it in the end if you are going to upgrade from 5.1 to 5.5. Um, at the end of the slides, I'll get to that. Uh, the vSphere web client, yes, we're all having to move to it. When you look at the new version of the what they call now the .NET client or the Windows client, um, we call it the VIC in-house for the old vSphere infrastructure client. But it, if you look at it, it tells you that this is the last version that will be supported. They still need the .NET client these days for SRM deployment and manipulation. And, um, of course, Update Manager still hasn't been upgraded in 5.5 yet to support anything. I mean, it's still using a 32-bit ODBC connector and everything else. So you still need the VIC or the vSphere client around. But the web client has been enhanced. Some of the enhancements include drag-and-drop objects from center to side inventory. And, of course, that'll kick off the appropriate wizard for you on the fly. They've added filters. Um, you can now select properties from a list of displayed objects and filters to meet the specific search criteria you're trying to do. Um, you can quickly narrow down what you're looking for. So if what you really wanted were only Windows 2008 VMs that were powered on, you could do that relatively quickly just by checking a couple of boxes and saying search. So it gives you more, in essence, filtering, ad hoc, whatever you want to call it, power to, to find specifically what you want. They've also added a recent items navigation aid. Allows focus on commonly performed tasks. So if you only perform, most of us probably only do on any given day, 6, 8, 10 specific tasks. We may do them over and over and over. This gives you the ability to go to almost like a recent list and pull up what you did and do it again kind of thing. So that's kind of slick. And for you Mac users out there, you'll be happy to know that full support for OS X is now there. Uh, that includes... Full VM console capability. Woohoo! So uh, that is good news for Mac users out there. Another vCenter enhancement is called vSphere App HA. In earlier versions, uh, it was possible to enable virtual machine monitoring, which checked, of course, for the presence of heartbeats through VMware tools, as well as I.O. activity from the uh, VMs. If neither of those were detected in a specified amount of time, the HA would reset the VM. Additionally, you could monitor applications, but you had to have third-party agents, or you had to create your own agents using the vSphere guest SDK. In 5.5, they've simplified the application monitoring with the introduction of this technology, App HA. Uh, the new feature works in conjunction with vSphere HA hosts monitoring and virtual machine monitoring to improve your app uptime. It can be configured to restart an app service when an issue is detected. Uh, it's possible to protect several commonly used off-the-shelf apps this way. You can also reset the VM if the application fails to restart. The architecture uh, it leverages VMware's purchase of Hy Hyperic, basically. So they've got vFabric Hyperic now to monitor the apps. You basically deploy uh, two appliances, a vSphere App HA appliance and a vFabric appliance, as you can see down in the picture below. Um, and then you deploy an agent, which is the Hyperic, the vFabric Hyperic agent inside whatever system you're running. Um, you notice that the App HA stores and manages policies in relation to it, whereas the Hyperic monitors your apps and enforces those policies. The simple process of deploying Hyperic in these appliances and agents installed in your VMs allows you to protect off-the-shelf apps. That makes it very nice to use. So another good enhancement for vCenter. Continuing on with App HA, some of the policies you can set uh, you can define the number of minutes to wait before a restart, the option to reset a VM if the service restart fails, and you can also have an option to reset a VM if a service is deemed unstable. You can trigger uh, vCenter alarms in the event that one of the VM's services or the VM itself is restarted. You can also set up email notification, which is nice. To enable it, basically you right-click on a VM and assign the policy, as you see in the picture. Pretty slick. Continuing on with our vCenter enhancements, we've got HA and DRS. 
virtual machine and affinity rules. We know the DRS has the ability to do VM to VM affinity and anti-affinity rules. Uh, affinity is going to keep two VMs together when they move from one host to another. Uh, same thing with anti-affinity, it keeps them apart. You want to make sure that certain VMs uh, are kept apart. Um, for whatever reason you have, I mean, obviously some good reasons would be things like DNS and D separate exchange servers or DCs or things like that. Um, but there may be other considerations as well as to why you're doing it, maybe telephony or whatever. Um, in earlier versions, HA did not detect virtual machine to virtual machine anti-affinity rules. So it might have violated one of the HA during a failover policy event, I mean. Uh, DRS, if fully enabled, would evaluate the environment and then move that VM after it was powered up, even if two of them came up on the same host. Some environments have strict multi-tenancy or compliance restrictions um, that would adversely affect the situation, would uh, contradict what your needs were. To address it and maintaining the placement in this scenario, 5.5 five is enhanced to conform with the anti-affinity rules. Application availability is maintained through controlling the placement of the VM. So basically, it's going to make sure it places the VMs on separate hosts on the fly the first time so it doesn't have to vMotion them after the fact, therefore maintaining the compliance that you have. That's a nice addition as well. Next, we have VDP, VMware's GUI Backup and Restore Utility. Um, They've continued to make enhancements to this over time. Um, it is backup and recovery solution. It's fully integrated with vSphere and the web client, of course. Um, in 5.5, it's included with everything from Essentials Plus licensing on up. Enhancements include direct to host emergency restore. So your VDP can be used to restore a VM directly to a vSphere host without the need for vCenter or the web client. What's the value of that, you ask? Well, what if you have your vCenter as a VM and you need to restore it? That's what the capability allows you to do now. That's pretty slick, especially for a product directly from VMware that's included for free. Um, it also is enhanced to backup and restore individual VMDKs. Okay? And you can now replicate your backup data to EVC or EMC's Avamar. So you can have off-site uh, copies of your backup data storage for uh, DR scenarios. It's got flexible storage placement. When you're deploying VDP, separate data scores can be selected for the OS partition and the backup data partition. Also, mounting of existing backup data, or data storage to the new appliances. When you install a new appliance, you can choose an old VDP backup partition, data partition and mount it to the new appliance which is really slick. And finally, they've added granular, uh, gr increased granularity for VDP. You can pick job times that start at, you know, 1 a.m., 1.15, 3 p.m., you know, midnight, whatever. So, big data, anybody working with Hadoop? Well, they've got full support for big data extensions. New addition for Enterprise or Enterprise Plus licensees, tool that enables your administrators to deploy and manage Hadoop clusters. You can see here, uh, it's based on technology from Serengeti. It is open source, uh, virtual management tool. And you see uh, some of the functions it can perform, create and delete and start, resize clusters, control cluster resource usage, specify server topology, manage your Hadoop distributions, and auto scale based on needs and resources, workloads, etc. On to storage enhancements. One of the ones we've been waiting for forever has been going beyond the two terabyte disk limit for a VMDK. Well, the old limit is now gone. We are up to 62 terabytes. Yes, that's 62, not 64. Um, you can have your virtual compatibility mode RDMs all the way up to 62 terabytes as well. And your deltas from VMware snapshots can be up to 62 terabytes. Any of you out there still using Microsoft Clustering Services clusters, they have updates uh, to their support at VMware for that in 5.5. Um, specifically, Microsoft's Windows 2012 round-robin path policy for shared storage 
iSCSI protocols and fiber channel over Ethernet. Um, historically, you had to use fiber channel, a hardware-based fiber channel only. Uh, they've relaxed that restriction, basically supporting fiber channel over Ethernet and iSCSI now. Uh, they've also tweaked out the locking, the SCSI locking mechanism used by clustering services uh, so they can do this um, basically for iSCSI pathing. Uh, any path can be free, can uh, free the reservation now, so that's kind of slick. 16 gig fiber channel end-to-end -end support. Uh, in 5.0, they introduced the capability to use 16 gig fiber channel HBAs, but they were throttled down to 8 gigs. In 5.1, um, there was support for 16 gig, but the only way to get it was to have a number of 8 gig connections um, created from the switch to the storage array. In 5.5, they finally introduced end-to-end -end full 16 gigabit. Um, as long as the fiber channel switch in between supports it, you're good to go. They've continually enhanced the uh, permanent device loss, or PDL, uh, in this situation where a device is going to fail or it's removed in an uncontrolled fashion. Yeah, nobody's ever done that, right? Uh, PDL is going to detect if it's permanently removed using SCSI sense codes, and the device enters a PDL state. The host can take action to prevent directing any further unnecessary I.O., that's going to alleviate conditions like running out of threads, worker threads, and things like that. 5.5, the new feature called PDL Auto Remove, uh, removes the device from the host when it enters a PDL state. Why is that good? Well, you know there's a 255 disk device limit on every host. Well, since that particular disk can no longer accept I.O., it's a good idea to remove it from the host. Uh, if it comes back online or if it's... Uh, re-added, then it will be uh, added as a new device at that point and treated like it's a brand new device. That's something that works along with that hot remove, hot add capability of the PCIe SSDs we talked about at the beginning. Um, it also uses this PDL auto remove as a way of understanding that the device removed is gone and what's being put in is a brand new one. Flash read cache. This is an exciting technology. It is available in the storage enhancements on the hosts right now. Basically, um, a new storage solution that provides cache at each host for writes. Now, you can use it for the host swap cache, which came out recently as one more way to uh, reclaim memory from a host. Um, it also replaces that swapped SSD that was introduced in 5.0. Um, but it can provide write-through cache, enhancing your VM's performance. Basically, the VMs don't know it's there. It's inserted between uh, the VM and the, the path to the storage um, and fully supports VMs for vMotion and everything else. You can have up to two terabytes of uh, flash read cache per host. And it supports all kinds of data stores, not just SSDs, but you got NFS and VMDKs and RDMs and all kinds of things. So something you definitely want to take a look at. Um, a lot of our customers are looking at this as a way of possibly sticking SSDs into a host if they have the slots and the controllers, and then uh, still utilizing some of their older, slower um, SATA-based SANs and, and NFSs, um, but giving them the kind of performance that our only newer SANs can bring because of their SSD caching capabilities. Networking enhancements. In 5.1, we had uh, LACP support standards-based method for controlling bundling of several physical network links together in the form of a logical channel or lag. Um, the 5.5 uh, enhancements, comprehensive load balancing through algorithms. They've got 22 new hashing algorithm options available. So, for example, you've got source and destination IP address and VLAN fields that can be used to input for a hashing algorithm. That's one way. You've got support for multiple link aggregation groups or lags, 64 per host and 64 per VDS. Uh, distributed switch VDS are now supported. Um, because LACP was configured on a per host basis, it could be time consuming. Well, they've introduced new workflows to configure LACP across a large number of hosts. Okay. Next, we've got traffic filtering. Yes, yay. Access control lists are now being added. Okay, The VDS supports packet classification based on three different types of qualifiers. 
Mac source and destination address qualifiers or system traffic such as vMotion and management, fault tolerance, software iSCSI, and all the things that we saw pools for um, in network I.O. control uh, before. Um, we've got for qualifiers here with access control list as well. We also have IP qualifiers, protocol sender, I mean protocol type, sender IP, destination IP, port number, are things that you can specify. After that's been selected, you can choose to either filter or tag packets. And if you choose filtering, it supports ingress, egress, or both. So one more enhancement. Every time we turn around, they've added another thing to the distributed switch, which brings it closer to uh, what Cisco and IBM had brought out for their just third-party distributed switches. Quality of service tagging. We did support previously 802.1p uh, class of service applied at the Ethernet layer 2 packet. Um, the other type of quality of service is differentiated service code point or DC, DSCP, sorry, applied on IP packets. Okay. Um, basically inserting tags into the IP header. And yes, we're talking layer 3 here. So um, supports layer 3 environments where physical routers would function better with an IP header rather than the Ethernet MAC layer header. Okay. After your packets are classified based on the qualifiers, uh, users get to choose layer 2 or layer 3 a header level mar marking, and they can be configured at the port group level. So. Next, we have SRIOV. That was also introduced in previous versions. Um, standard based for using a single uh, PCI express card or adapter, typically a NIC, uh, which is presented as logical devices to multiple VMs. Single NIC acting as separate logical devices to those VMs. In 5.5, the workflow of configuring it has been SRIOV enabled and physical NICs is easier. Uh, New capability introduced so that you can communicate the port group properties defined on the either a standard switch or a distributed switch to the virtual functions. And a new control path through both switch types communicates that port group specific properties to those virtual functions. So for example, and I think it's on the slide there as well, if you uh, if you had promiscuous mode enabled on a port group, the configurations passed to the virtual functions and the virtual machines connected to that port group could receive traffic from all the other virtual machines. Host level, packet capture. Basically, they're providing us with a command line only tool at the host, like Linux's TCP dump, that allows you to capture traffic on either standard switches or distributed switches. And you can capture them at the uplink or the switch port or the VNIC on the VM. You can capture drop packets as well as trace the packet path with timestamp details. And a final networking enhancement is 40 gig E support. They specifically brought out support for the Mellanox Connect X3 uh, adapter in Ethernet mode. So. Obviously, they'll add more and more as more vendors come out with 40 gig uh, capable pathways for us in Ethernet. Now, one of the common problems that we see in consulting ever since 5.5 came out is this. When you go to upgrade vSphere 5.1 to 5.5, there's a rollback. SSO rolls back after importing the lookup service data. There's a KB article. 2060511 related to this specifically that gives you the details on how to solve it. Um, it'll fail if there's a mismatch between the certificate for the 5.1 SSO and the related registry key that indicates the system is DNS enabled. Uh, I literally did one earlier this week, had the same thing. One was set to an IP and the other was in the certificate, it was set to a, an FQDN. Um, it affects some V5.1 systems running with default certificates that are upgraded to vSender 5.5 under specific conditions. Who's not affected? If you're using custom certificates, or if you're doing a clean or fresh install of 5.5, or if you're upgrading from 5.0 or 4x, or if you did a fresh install of 5.1 update 1a or later, when you upgrade to 5.5, you won't get it. But if you did the upgrade, upgrade, upgrade path like many of us have done in the past, 
um, or many of my clients have, I should say, um, then you could run, run into this. So the KB article walks you through how to check what you've got in both sides, the registry and the certificate, and uh, clean that up. So, Jeff Hall, I think I'm going to turn the rest of this over to you. We've got three slides left here, everybody. Um, next one after this is going to be Q&A. So I've tried to keep within my 40 to 45 minute range there. I'm right about 30, 43 minutes so far. So, Jeff, are you still with us or did I put you to sleep? Since oh, I am here. I had myself on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. And if you have any questions, feel free to go type those in the chat and we'll try to take as many as we can before the end of, the, end of our time here together. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we did cover a few of the new features from um, 5.1 to 5.5 today, but there are many more that are um, that we will cover actually in our in the uh, vSphere 4x to 5x upgrade class that's available. Um, and so, so if you have any qu additional questions or are interested in, in learning more and actually get some hands-on uh, experience with this, you may want to look into that class and talk to your training center uh, representatives, and they'll gladly help you. Uh, you know, assess where you need to go and uh, and so forth. Some of the features of this new class is that we do cover not just the 5.1 to 5.5 upgrade, but we do talk about previous version upgrades because we do know that a lot of people aren't at 5.1 still. There are a lot of people still at 4.1 or 5.0. So we do cover how to upgrade from those all the way up to 5.5 in this class. Again, we do cover about uh, the 5.1 and 5.5 new features, and obviously more of the ones that we talked about here today because they only had a limited amount of time. But we also have labs that are able to get you some hands-on experience with these new features as well. We do have some class dates that are scheduled um, already uh, for this class, and these are just the, it's a two-day class, so these are the start dates of 10.28 and 11.25 and so on. Again, talk to your training representatives. Uh, they'll gladly help you and get into those classes. We also are uh, updating our current Ultimate Boot Camp, the vSphere 5.1 to a 5.5. We're looking at a, a November release. And so if you're not, if you just want more than just the features because you need a little bit of additional training, that would be a great class. We do cover all, obviously, all the new features from 5.1 to 5.5 and obviously from other versions as well. We do cover multiple classes in one. It's a very con comprehensive class with lots of hands-on experience with our labs. Um, the whole point of this is make sure that you have the ability to perform your job as a vSphere administrator. And again, talk to your training representatives. They will gladly help you figure out which class is best suited for you. Can we go to the next slide there, Jeff? Um, so we will gladly take some uh, questions. We do have a couple that have come across. Um, Let's uh, see. Is, you got them? Yeah, the, the PowerPoint slides, are we going to make those available after the recording, Jeff? I, I believe so. Can. Yeah, I'd like, uh, we'd like to. Um, we will do what we can on that one. Where would they um, normally get to those? Um, actually, right now, if you just want to go ahead and send me a request, um, and this is Jeff Hall speaking, and I'll type my uh, email address here in the chat window for everybody. So if you wanted a copy of the slides, go ahead and send me a request. I will gladly get those to you as soon as I can. Then we have, let's see, uh, is there still database required for vCenter in a new in the new version since the SSO database was dropped? Absolutely. The database requirements are basically the same as what they were before. As I even mentioned during the lecture, the uh, we're still using the 32-bit ODBC connector if you get a SQL database for the update manager database portion of things. So, yep, still need to use the same databases. Um, don't hold me to this because I haven't worked with one, but I think they dropped support for DB2 now. I think they're just at SQL and Oracle at least for the Windows version. Obviously, they've gone to the post-GRE SQL embedded, and actually in the uh, vSphere appliance, the Linux-based appliance version of vCenter, and that has been enhanced to support, what did I just read? Some ridiculous number of, like, 300 hosts and 1,000 VMs or something like that. So, um, let's see. What else do we have? Is VMware View support for Linux guest VMs on the horizon? VMware View. <clears throat> horizon View, that's a good question, especially since they haven't brought out. Typically, they do with Verizon. I mean, with View, they bring out a new version a little bit later, typically anywhere from three to six months later, that really fully supports the current version um, of vSphere. Uh, so I would guess that if it's going to happen, it's there. I haven't heard anything, so I'm, I'm sorry I can't specifically answer that. 
but I would guess yes. I mean, they, they listen to the Linux world all the time. Uh, a lot of the engineers there are Linux people themselves in-house. So I'm thinking, yeah, no doubt. Um, are there any hints on whether the NSX product will become a replacement for SDN routers, such as the Cisco CRS cloud service router product? Any hints on whether it will become a replacement for SDN routers? Um, a replacement for, I don't know. I, I, I just saw something recently that, I think that was even this morning. They don't hold me to it since I'm, you know, running on you know, zero hours of sleep in the last 36. But I, I think they, I saw Cisco is supporting NSX exactly how I don't know. I know it works in the UCS and everywhere else. So replacement for their SDN routers, I, I don't, I just, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Don't know that one off the top of my head. Um, I can is give there... you my email as well if you want, and you can. Email me directly on that, and I would be glad to uh, research it for you. Here, let me type that in. Um, another question that we have is, is there an update for VMware View Horizon as well, or is this not affected by this upgrade? It is not affected by this upgrade. If you are at 5.2, okay, if you're at running Horizon View 5.2 currently with your Horizon View 5.4 clients, then you do not need to upgrade. Um, I, we actually finally got around. Our clients wanted us to upgrade them so fast when it came out. We didn't get a chance to do an in-house upgrade with our own systems until earlier this week. Um, and I, I knew the spec was covered, but I honestly didn't even think about it. And I went ahead and upgraded us. I'm like, oh, I should have done view first. Oh, yeah, there's no new view. So view 5.2 officially supports uh, vSphere 5.5. Simple answer to that. Any other questions you have for us? If if so, we'll go ahead and start wrapping up. But um, two things. Uh, if you have any additional questions that you come up uh, later on, feel free to check out our forum at forum.vmtrain.net and ask those questions there. We'll gladly answer um, your questions there and get back to you on the forum. So uh, feel free to check those out. We're going to um, actually kind of also look in the future for a little contest on our forum site as well. We're getting that uh, about ready to be the release, so I'll just kind of drop a little hint or a foreshadow there. So we're going to run a forum um, contest on our forums as well. Um, if you have any questions with regards to you know a possible rep, uh, go ahead and ask me. I will gladly get you uh, in contact with uh, one of our partners in your area to help you um, figure out what class is best for you. Um, and then I don't have anything else, Jeff, so if you want to go to the last slide. Okay. Uh, just I... what. <laughs> there you go. Technology go. issues, you know. Yeah, gotcha. So uh, just to wrap up, we'd just like to thank you all again for attending. And if, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email us or uh, stop by our forum. We'll gladly answer those. And we look forward to you uh, for our next webinar that will be coming up shortly. Thank you all. Hope you learned a little bit about what's new and hope to see you in a class soon or at least on the forums. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>